Hey guys, this is Doc Huffpower coming to you from my studio here in Alvin, Texas for the Dear Doc podcast. Today we've got a really great guest. Uh, many of you may know him, and that is David Phelps. Today we're going to cover a lot of different things from the economy to investing to real estate investing. Uh, we're just going to be all over the map. Try to keep up. Hey folks, welcome to the Dear Doc Podcast, where we discuss the practical aspects of running your dental practice, as well as the technology, softwares, and services that can help to empower you as a dentist. I'm your host, Doc Huffpower. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. Before we get into today's program, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about one of our sponsors, DocSites. DocSites provides affordable and effective websites for dentists with no long-term contracts, transparent pricing, and great customer service starting at only $59 per month. They also provide optional online marketing packages to help you increase your online visibility. For special offers, including up to 25% off of your website setup, text PODCAST to 818-489-9823. Again, that's 818-489-9823. Now this is a limited time offer, so text now and lock in your savings, or you can visit DocSites.com forward slash TBOD for more information. Dave, how's it going? Hi, Doc. It's always great to see you. Things are going well. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. It's been quite a number of, um, of, of years. Actually, I guess it's been about a year and a half since we, since we spoke last. And for those of you out there who don't know Dave, um, Dave, do me a favor uh, if you wouldn't mind, talk to them a little bit about your history, just nice, a uh, nice synopsis of, sure. you know, dentistry to where you are right now. Yeah, I, I took the path that probably all of your listeners took uh, going getting into school and, and going to dentistry. I did take a little bit of a, uh, an outside look at with my curiosity into wanting to learn how to become a better, call it a steward of money I would someday have, right? Going through school, you don't usually have money. You're usually waiting tables, which is what I did, but trying to get through school. But I started reading books about about investing money when I was in college, latter part of college, and then I decided with the help of my dad to buy a, a rental property first year of dental school here in Dallas, uh, which was then Baylor, now Texas A&M. And I went down the road of obviously dentistry and clinical practice, but I took that one property that my dad and I uh, bought together. He provided the financing, I did the management. And I learned a lot about that. I learned what a capital asset was. And, you know, back then I was trying to figure out, well, how do you invest money? I mean, stock market and mutual funds were just coming out in the late 80s. And there was a lot of talk about that. And so I read books about, about that. And I thought, well, that's interesting a uh, way to invest. Uh, but I just like the aspect of something tangible. Uh, that's what I think every everyone who owns a business or a practice, I mean, that's a tangible asset. You're working in it, but it's a tangible asset. And we think about our investments being more financial products. I'm not saying either are right or wrong, but I just like tangible better. So the, the real estate provided me uh, an opening to see things from a pretty early standpoint in my career while going into dentistry and doing what most of us have done. And I, I ran that, that clinical practice for about 20 years. Um, my daughter got very sick very early in life. Uh, when she was uh, two and a half, she had uh, end stage, excuse me, end stage liver failure came later. She was uh, diagnosed with high-risk leukemia when she was very young and then Subsequently, had uh, epileptic seizures, and at age 12, she was in end-stage liver failure, had a liver transplant. And I was about 20 years into practice at that point. Uh, I was about 42 years old, and I really had to make a decision then. Do I keep doing what I've been doing, which is what we all have to do, is provide for our family. I've got a practice. I've got responsibilities to staff and the patients, but I also have some responsibilities to my family. And how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you navigate that? And it wasn't an easy decision, but in some ways it was because I certainly put my my family, my daughter's uh, needs and, and time over everything else I did. So I I, I took took off the took off the, the dentist hat, I sold my practice, and just took that capital and put into what I'd already done in real estate, which wasn't wasn't you know magnanimous. It wasn't you know I wasn't some multimillionaire. I just realized back then that I had enough, and that's the key thing I try to show docs today is is how much is enough. Not that you can't set a bar and, and let it increase, but that's the problem for most people. It's like it just, you feel goal posts keep going higher and higher and higher and you stay on the treadmill. And I, I, so my daughter's situation just said, well, you've got to make a decision here, David. Do you keep doing, try to balance it, which I wasn't balancing very well, or do you just take some time off? And I was just looking for time off, Doc. I wasn't thinking I would just quote, retire out of dentistry completely. That's ultimately what I did, but it wasn't the first goal. It was just, I need about a year, year and a half off to really spend time with my daughter because I hope this, this liver transplant works. If it does, it's great. If it doesn't, you know, I don't want to have regrets. I already felt like I had regrets in my life because I 
focus so much on the doing the good work in the practice, building the practice, the things that we go to school for. And so I, so I left, left it. And I, so I, there was a period of time where I was a little bit freewheeling. Obviously my time was focused on my daughter. That's where I wanted to be. But I also had more margin just to think about, well, what do I want to do? I can always go back. I can start another practice. I can be an associate. I mean, lots of things you could still do. And I just started getting people asking me, well, David, I understand why you left clinical practice because of your daughter, but what we don't understand is how you did it. Cause I never, I never talked about it, real, real estate. It was always something on the side and I never mixed the two together. And so I had just enough people say, well, could you show me how I said, well, I could show you how I did it. But I started when I was back in my twenties and you're in your forties, you know, you're not going to do it the way I did it. Cause I was, I didn't have a family then. I didn't have a, a daughter. Uh, I wasn't busy in my practice, my time value in the chair. You're in the chair for you is a lot greater than it was for me back when I was in my twenties or not even a dentist. So it's a different ball game, but I said, I'd certainly show you, I'll let you piggyback on some of the, the opportunities that I have because I built a network. And that's just kind of what, what kind of led me to like, well, what else could I do besides your know, clinical dentistry? And it just led me to what today is, is, is freedom founders and, and helping a lot of, you know, our docs, you know, navigate some of the questions that they have about how do I exit? When do I exit? How much is enough? You know, a lot of the questions that come up that keep people kind of in a, in a grind, I think longer than they need to be. Yeah. I, there's a lot there to unpack. Um, one of the things that you talked about was being a multimillionaire and you said, you know, I wasn't a multimillionaire. And I think, I think you, you put your finger right on it that enough is never enough there. Um, you have to understand what you're chasing. And that, that's something that you and I have talked about a lot before is what that end goal is that you are, you know, after what, where, where do you want to be in life? Um, I think a lot of dentists out there are rich, but not wealthy. Yeah. And I'd like you to dive into talking about those two terms. Um, I, sure. I think you and I are of a, of a mind on that. So go ahead and uh, just jump in my friend. Yeah, I, I, you're right. I think there's a, a very much a distinction between being rich and wealthy. Rich, I think applies to people that uh, work hard, um, have some education, some skill set that allows them to do something that uh, provides for the the ability to earn an above average income, whatever that scale may be. And as long as you can do that and you're okay doing that, you can live kind of a pretty nice darn lifestyle in, in the United States today. Uh, wealthy to me means you've got options. You've got options about what you do, uh, how you do it, with whom you do it, where you do it, when you do it. That can still be dentistry. It doesn't mean you have to leave this, the thing that you learn to do. Um, it's what I think to a degree, you know, that you took the option to do just a few years ago and you're still a dentist. You still do clinical dentistry, but you've got a lot of other things that you were building and doing kind of like I was. And so you've got mm -hmm. what I call optionality. You, you can, you can do a lot of things. Wealth means you, you really have your time uh, at the forefront and it doesn't mean golf seven days a week. It doesn't mean lying on the beach. It doesn't mean retirement to me at all. I think it just means you, you can evolve in who you are and what you really desire for for your life and your family and where you put that time. You still, we all still want to be relevant. I don't, I don't want to quit being relevant to somebody somehow until the day I die. Uh, but it doesn't mean I have to do the same thing I started doing when I was in my twenties or thirties. It'd be different if we, if we give ourselves the margin and we have a little bit more certainty and clarity about, you know, how much is enough to take the next, just the next step, not how much to retire, how much to sell the practice, but how much to take the next step or change the model a little bit. Just change the model. Well, what does that mean? It can mean a lot of different things, we know. Uh, but so many people, I think, are afraid to upset the apple cart uh, because they're getting by. But getting by comes with a lot of angst, a lot of stress, especially today, not just dentistry, but I think small business overall today went through COVID and still on the backside. We've still got labor issues. We've got higher costs and overhead and all the things we can talk about that are negative. It doesn't have to be negative, but we just have more clarity about what we're really driving towards. And then know what that looks like specifically. And I, when I talk to doctors, it's like, they don't have a specific idea of what they want. It's just kind of out there. Well, I'd like more time off. Well, how much time off exactly? Well, I don't know. I need more money. Well, how much more money specifically do you need? I don't know. It's just always more. It's more, but never right. specificity. And if you don't have specificity, you can't measure an outcome. If you have a measured outcome, then you can say, okay, I want this in this amount of time. Now let's reverse engineer to where we are today. Okay, what are the possibilities of getting there? What's that look like? What are the different pathways to get there? Now we've got something to work with. But until then, it's just a big vacuum of disorganized thoughts and whims and dreams and desires that just never come to fruition for a lot, for a lot of people. You know, I I always love talking to you because um, 
we think very much alike, but we came at it from two different directions. Um, so I actually retired from clinical back in 2020. So I'm very happy to be able to do that. I think I help more dentists. I, I think you know my story. I got into mm -hmm. dentistry because I almost died from a dental infection yeah. and I wanted to give my life to dentistry because I felt that I owed it a life. I, I, I would have died otherwise. Uh, I felt that I could help more dentists and thus more patients outside of the chair than in the chair. Right. But some of the things that you were talking there, you're, you're talking about having specificity. And I believe that the word that was eluding you is, is twofold intention and purpose. Uh, when you, when you retire, the reason that people die shortly after they retire is because they no longer have purpose. I'm a mm -hmm. huge believer in serial retirement. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I looked at my life and I said, what do I need to live? What do I need to be able to provide for my family? And that was about $250,000 a year. I mean, we wouldn't be super rich there, but we'd be wealthy. We'd, if, if we had time, everything was already paid for. So I said, well, working backward from that, what do I have to do? Well, this is how I invest. So I need about four and a half million dollars in the bank to be able to retire and get a $250,000 a year income. Okay, so let's go and do that. So I worked my way backward through it. And then I met each goal with, with intention. You know, when I hit that four million, I said, okay, I can retire now, but I don't have to. I can put aside a little bit more. Um, and then I had some other opportunities that came to me and I said, you know, maybe, maybe I need to go and, and check out these new opportunities. And I started working less and I said, yeah, I really, I want to have at least two days a week where I can just do whatever I want to do and I can take meetings and, you know, I think I'm just going to work three days a week. And, you know, eventually I just got to the point where I said, okay, I'm just going to retire fully. Yeah. So I retired fully. Um, we had some health issues in the, in the family, a lot like you, my son had a, um, a health crisis and he was hospitalized for three months and had an associate. And I, I just basically at that point, after three months of not doing clinical, I just thought to myself, wow, my days are so productive now. I can do so much that I couldn't do because I was in clinic and, you know, not being able to take meetings and things like that. So I, I get exactly where you are. It, one of the things that we've talked about is everyone wants to show you the how but unless you know the why and the what behind that, you'll never be truly successful. Not going to happen. No. So, so what I'd like you to do, um, just start out with this investing 101, and we'll add real estate in there, or we'll start with real estate. I'm going to kind of let you take the head on this one because you kind of know what your journey was, and you teach this stuff. Which, by the way, guys, this is some free knowledge bombs right here. Uh, Dave never holds anything back. He's got several books you can go and you can read, but he's also a great coach. So if you hear this stuff and you say, you know, that's great to say, but I really need someone to motivate me and, and help to push me through, or I need someone to do a little hold handing. So I, uh, hand holding rather, so I can get started, or I just need a, a confidant to bounce ideas off of Dave's your man. So he, he's not a sponsor. He's not paying us to be on the podcast but he's just got some really fantastic knowledge and he's always willing to share it. So please perk your ears up and give the man a listen. Dave. Hey guys, this is Doc Huffpower, founder of the business of dentistry and host of the Dear Doc podcast. Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about one of our sponsors. 4G Dental Labs has been a sponsor of the business of dentistry for over two years now. They're a family owned business located here in Houston, Texas. They're fast, they're reliable, but best of all, they provide affordable quality. They're just plain, honest, good people. For our TBOD members, for your first 20 crowns, every fifth one will be free. Contact 4G Dental Labs at 833-682-8901. Again, that's 833-682-8901. Or you can mail or even just stop by. Jeff Guidi, the owner, would be glad to see you. Well, so, so you want to talk a little bit about just specifically investing, uh, the way I see it for most busy professional practitioners, a little bit of that. Well, okay. So first of all, you know, I am biased towards alternative investments or tangible assets. Uh, not to saying that people shouldn't have money in the financial products in the stock market, whatever you want to do. That's, right. I'm not here to, to tell people what you should or shouldn't do, but I truly believe doc that again, along the lines of what, what you've done. Uh, and that is, I think we 
go into business practice, particularly those who are owners or want to be owners, because we want to navigate our future. Whether it's dentistry or some other kind of business, we want to navigate our future. That's the whole reason of owning a business. Now, we know that there comes with a lot of sacrifice in doing that. There's a lot to learn besides the clinical aspects of what we learned in school. There's so much, but we do it for the reason that we want to, we want to have that control. Uh, control causes a lot of responsibility. I oftentimes wonder why so many high income, highly skilled, specialized, educated professionals, be it dentists that we're talking to primarily like today, why they abdicate, I'll just use that word, abdicate their financial investment future to financial planner, a money manager to Wall Street. To There's 401k. no one who's smarter than you are. Yeah. It might and, be more knowledgeable, but you can fix that. Well, we, we can. I, and I think there's there's a big misnomer there. And I think it's it's really media and Wall Street, very good marketers. I am not dismissing or downplaying whatsoever having advisors around us. We need a team of all kinds of advisors. But I think we need to be at the center of orchestrating whatever advice we're taking. I think that's, and I think that's the problem with the financial side is, is people just kind of give it away. I, I talk, I talk to hardworking docs every day and it's the same thing. Well, I talked to one just the other day. He has two different advisors because that's his, his mode of diversification. I'll just have two different advisors and they have to be different kinds of products. And it's like nothing's coordinated at all. It's just whatever that advisor's uh, deems is appropriate. Uh, and maybe it's appropriate because you're getting paid to, to make it appropriate. I don't know. I'm just saying you always have to look at where the incentives are, and then you can kind of see what the outcome is going to be. So you have to be careful of that. But you know, why why do doctors that are so much on, on the forefront of navigating their, their practice to whatever whatever that want, they want that to be, whether it's a solo practice or or to have a multi doc or to, to sell to a DSO or partnerships? That's what we want to do. But we just put the, the financials on the on the on the sideline. Say, well, I'll just hope it hope it works. Hope it works out. And there's just no clarity about that. No, not nothing what it looks like. And so what I realized is, is that there's a lot of misinformation about, you know, about this, this is the only way to do it. The default mode is, is everything on Wall Street. And I know for a fact that that doesn't have to be the way, but is it easy to, to navigate your finances? Well, you require some education, but everybody that we're talking to is educated and knows how to learn. It's just, it's just, we've been told, you know, you, you shouldn't do that. It's way too complicated a world. It's like, no, it's not. You could still orchestrate it. You're just going to get the advice around you. I don't know everything about real estate. I can't. There's too much changing and too much different markets. So how do I navigate that? Well, I've got my finger on the pulse of, of different people that I've engaged in my circles to give me the information I need. Well, same thing anybody else could, could do. You can do it on your own. It's what I did when I was young and going through. You've done it on your own, figuring things out, uh, creating a different communication your network. Uh, we both are big believers in network, having the time. So Freedom Founders is a place where, where I've just kind of collapsed or folded time for people who want that kind of a network in alternatives. So I think the first thing, Doc, going back to what your question was, is you've got to decide if you're going to start taking some level of responsibility for your own future finances. And yes, have advice at first. Don't do anything fancy. Don't start swinging for the moon. Just read, uh, listen to podcasts. But you know, back back when I started, there was, it was just books. I had books and I, and I found some good people that I went to seminars. So networking, finding the right people, and start to develop your own philosophy, whatever it is, whatever it might be, find your own philosophy and then get focused on it, uh, get some clarity about it. And, and just, it's kind of, a, it's, and it's a long game too, right? Doc, there's no swinging for the fences here. It's a, it's Jim Collins, the 20 mile march. It's just calm down effect of doing something with discipline, uh, and, and predictability, you know, over and over again. It's not a straight line. You're, there's ups and downs, but you learn as you go and that, and the learning capacity, which, which we all have to learn. I mean, all the docs we know. Uh, and we're not talking about clinical here, but I'm just saying clinical is mm -hmm. where people go because they, we want to learn. It's like, well, I want to learn how to do that better. I want to be able to treat people better. Well, same thing with your finances or business. It's like, you know, we all want to learn. So we just got to find the right places to learn and take the information in that's right for us at the right time and, and, and move forward. So that's, that's my number one without specifying whether it's real estate or, or, or anything else. It's just like find something that you can believe in and get a network and get advisement around you that you can start taking some steps forward. Now, that's something I want to interject here that I, I know that you agree with me on, but maybe a thought that hasn't occurred to a lot of people. When you're looking at your investments and you're looking at your portfolio, you really want to make sure you mitigate risk of some of your higher earning investments with something that's a little bit more solid, a little bit more stable. 
a lot of dentists think of their dental practice as an investment, and it can be. Mm -hmm. But in my book, and please disagree with me if 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 you if you do, I, I'd love to have the discussion. In my book, your dental practice is actually the riskiest investment in your portfolio. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think I think it depends. It depends uh, if 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 it's solely dependent upon you. And like you don't have anybody else, you know, you know, in providing producing some kind of income, generating income from it, right. then it, it's risky, and that's why you have disability insurance, right? That's why you set that up, and that's that's some some way to risk mitigate. It, uh, but yes, any time that a that income is solely dependent upon oneself, then that's high risk because something could happen to us. Uh, but again, that's why you have insurance. You can build out, I think, any kind of business to the extent you want to. And reduce right. that risk with different redundancies. You know, some people will, some people won't. Some people don't want to give up that control. And if that's the way it is, then you're right. Then I think then you really have to focus on well, what other income streams can I be building on the side to protect me, to give me some downside risk if something happens to me. I've got some coverage of disability, but disability doesn't kick in for two months, three months, maybe six months. You know, so I've got to cover that gap. Uh, that's what you do with 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 deductibles. So you got to cover the gap. But it just it depends. If you've got multiple docs, uh, if you've got partners, you know, then you probably mitigate a lot of that risk in that risk, regard. Risk mitigation. But that's, DSO. Selling yeah, to a DSO. Exactly. Risk yeah, no, mitigation. 100%. 100%. So that's, that's what you have to look at that. So I so I, I think it just depends, Doc. I think it depends on what that model looks like, whether whether you've got a lot of downside risk in that one model or if you've dissipated that risk uh, over redundancies and, and different uh, providers who provide different income streams. To Fantastic practice. points. Fantastic points. I, I love bringing up the fact that the small group practice model or the small DSO model um, really is what it is, is, yeah. you know, in anything with centralized controls mm -hmm. where you're scaling. And, and that's the big thing is that your dental practice isn't scalable unless, of course, you begin to employ other people. And when you do, you make less per person employed, but you mitigate risk, which Correct. is you know the, the big thing for me. So I want to talk a little bit about DSO participation in a little bit here. Um, because it was something you had posted about a little while back, and I really, I really appreciated your different viewpoint on it. Because there's a lot of arguing back and forth. People saying, "Oh, you know, you get all this money up front, but you really, you're paying them to buy your practice." And you know, there's a big, big shit storm about it on TBOD the other day. Um, or you know, people who sell to DSOs are stupid because they're really losing all this money and this and that and the other. I've always loved the idea of time value of money where I want my money now because I can invest it and grow it in different ways. Mm -hmm. But I know you may have some different outlooks and we can discuss that. But I'd also like to discuss economic outlook. And I think a lot of people don't realize that the that a capitalist economy and the more capitalist the economy is, the quicker the cycle. But a, cat a capitalist economy always goes between boom-bust cy cycles. Mm -hmm. It always follows a sigmoidal path. Um, mm -hmm. Now, in our economy, with the amount of socialization that we've got in our economy, because we don't have a pure capitalist system, we don't have a laissez-faire system, we generally tend toward a between 12- and 9-year cycle boom-bust um, Th that's just known fact. Anybody who disagrees with me, just go look, just go right. look it out because you're wrong. So talk to me a little bit about that, where we are in the cycle, what that means for your investments. Cause I think you think the same way I do. I think we're about to hit a big nasty crash right after Christmas, right. but um, we'll see. I, I could be wrong and, and I hope to hell I am, but. No, I, I think we're, we're in reverse agreement. You're right. Uh, we, we are, we are in boom bust cycles. That's the way it's, it's been for, centuries and will continue right. on and i think this last one has just been you know as they, the saying goes is the the fed and the government has just kicked the can down the road uh right. further and further so the higher the parabola goes up typically when there is the correction you know it, it's That's, version of the main re regression it's, exactly. it's going to drop it's going to take a heavy drop it's it, it's there and yeah there's there's so there's so many so much to talk about there but I'm in 100 percent agreement, and that people have called me out. It's so it's okay. It say, well, you know, you've been saying this stuff for for 18 months, two years, and granted, I have, <laughs> granted, I have. Uh, so 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 one could say, well, you know, if you're too early, David Phelps, you know, you missed you missed the big run up. Well, right. Two, that's you also missed two. the big loss. <laughs> yeah, you, well, it's, it's 2022, you know, everything dropped, and now we're having this this I call it kind of a faux 
reboot, but why is it happening? Well, right. Doc, between you, you and me, I think people that understand this, true growth is not based on debt. <laughs> right. That's not sustainable. That's what Wait, we're are doing. you saying that when you when you print eight trillion dollars, it's gonna have some sort of inflationary effect? What kind of effect is gonna happen? Yeah. Um so 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 I I, oh, I saw wow. they just uh, just this morning they revised uh, the already outstanding uh, for, uh, third quarter GDP from 4.9 to like 5.2, and everybody's clapping their hands in the markets. Take them, go, and 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 Powell's going to take a pause, and and, and by ne by by next year uh, they'll start reducing rates, and it's it's right. we're back to it again. We're back in a bull market. I'm just thinking, have, folks, you just you just don't understand the how much they're manipulating the data. Have and you the, seen? The oh, I know, and, and, and it's, it's all. It's all it, well, you know, dog, employment it's, numbers. They change the way they count it depending upon what they, they want to say. They, you know, they, well, they have to always go back and revise it because so right. so they lead they lead with numbers that they know aren't right. They have to go back and revise it, but that that just lets the media and the sentiment hear what they wanted to hear. Right. And the financial markets and the economy and even inflation, a lot of a lot of it's psychologically built in, right? I mean, right. it's what people think, and if people think a certain thing, well, it's going to take it so far. Uh, people think that inflation, you know, is is coming down. Well, the numbers they're showing is coming down, but truly, inflation uh, is is baked in like we haven't seen it in the last forty years. Uh, I'm not saying you know it's it's there, and so the Fed's Fed's in this rock and hard place. So you know, back back to your 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 question about well, how do how do we look at this? And yeah, you know, I spend a lot of time on this because I, it's how I how I think too. And you know, I I want to be a good steward of of the capital that I have, and I also want to be at least a a reasonable voice. Uh, not only just to, to, to my community, to, but wherever I write, I want to be a reasonable voice out there. Uh, I, I am probably more contrarian. Uh, you probably are too, uh, to most people, but that's, that's why I stand. I believe that, yes, there's going to be uh, equities across the board uh, are going to take a big hit. Financial, tangible, real estate. Um, in fact, you know, the, what I've seen happen in the, you mentioned the DSO market, mm -hmm. the real estate market is, plays in the same, same sphere. And I've seen what's happened there. We can get into that a little bit in a minute, but same thing is happening there. The, the change in the cost of capital, the dynamics that have shifted from just 18 months ago, even go back, you know, three or four years ago, the dynamics have changed not only in the private equity DSO model, but also for real estate. Big, big run up. All the stimulus money is chasing, chasing yield, low cost of capital, 0% funds, fed funds rate, and you can just roll the money over and over and over again. There's always something to buy. That That's changed. Yeah, the, the money, the money market is tightening like crazy for oh. raises right now. Um, I, I know I, I do a lot of investment. I work a lot with investment bankers, and what I found is that the capital is just not there anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, people are holding on to it, and I don't know if it's because they know there's a crash coming and they want to have, you know, flush pockets when it happens, or if they're simply trying to pull back so that they can they can they can build reserves to ride it out, but. One, one thing's for sure, the money's disappearing. I, I just noticed, I, you know, I just noticed uh, this morning that uh, Mark Cuban uh, sold a majority stake in uh, the Dallas Mavericks. Now, he could have any kind of reason to do that. But I'm just saying sometimes it's time when you're somewhere near the top of the market to take some chips off the table mm -hmm. if you know what to do better with them. But it goes back to, back to like our dental practices. I think, you know, if you're not in a position to know what to do with the capital, let's say you, you, get, you get a sale, you get a buyout, you, you get some front end cash and it feels good, right? Uh, but I think if you don't know what to do with it, that could be a scary thing for a lot of people. And I see that also. It's like, hey, I'm at the finish line and I've got this offer and it's looking good. And I'm gonna get, but, you know, but like with the DSO buyout, you're gonna have to stay off for some period of time and get the earn out on the back end. So I get this amount of money, but now my income and my previous owner distributions have gone down. So now I've got to take this capital that I took out of practice on the sale or the buyout. I got to do something with that. And a lot of people go, I've never been in this position before. And now, mm -hmm. to, and, and they're cognizant enough to know that in the back of the mind, putting it in the market, probably in the, the way most people would, to keep riding it up is probably not what they want to do because this is the, like their last hurrah for many. It's like, I can't take the big hit right now. When you're younger and you still are driving your equity in your business, yeah, you can take a few moonshots and some stuff, right? Because you can come back and fight to live another day. But you start getting to your 50s or your 60s and you're going, okay, I can't play that game anymore. I've got to get serious about what I do with this capital base that I've saved up and, and from the sale of the practice. I gotta be smart about that now. And I've, and I've never done that before. Like that's the conversation I get to have a lot. And again, not, not that, not that I have a perfect world by, mm -hmm. by no means, but I just believe in the, in the tangible asset space, 
if one's willing to get the education, one's willing to create a network, it's what you're talking about, what you do right now. You're out there, you're you're navigating your capital base, but you're staying in touch. It's not entirely passive, is it? Right. No. It's there, not, there, no. there is no such thing as passive income. Well, CD. <laughs> Treasury. Is that really income? Is anything that doesn't beat inflation income? Or is it just slow loss? Well, in this case, it's slow loss, but it, yeah, right. it's... Yeah. So, so you're right. And that's, and that's my point. That's why there's no such thing as passive income. There is passive slow loss. Yes. Um, I was, I was having a discussion with someone the other day and try not to to try not to laugh too much. I just left the discussion because I got to the point when they said this, I'm going to say it, I'm gonna see if you cringe. (laughs) When they said this, I realized there was no possible way for me to make my point in a way that they would understand it. I was talking about inflation. I said, you know, I said, you know, printing money is inflationary. We just we've printed over the last two administrations eight trillion dollars, eight trillion with a T, and that means we are going to have a bust cycle soon. We can't help but have a bust cycle. There's always runaway inflation, and the guy told me he said the economy's never been better. Just look at GDP, <laughs> and my head fucking exploded, Dave. So yeah. I was like, this guy doesn't understand yeah. that GDP is directly freaking linked to inflation. Exactly. Exactly. And this was, this was an investment guru. So. That really? was- well, that's, well, that's interesting. Um, yeah. I, you know, it's, there's just, there's just a lot of naivete and a lot of ignorance when it comes to this. And it, it's so important. I, I think particularly again, for people that, that we're talking to who really who care about their future. And so far, you know, with their businesses and practices have been navigating that, I mean, right hands on, right. But you, you've got you've got to be in the mixer. You've got to have some understanding of how much our markets. You said earlier we don't have free markets anymore. They're manipulated. You just got to get over the fact that there's nothing fair anymore. It's just if you're not understanding what's going on in the markets, you're going to be at a loss. Absolutely. And that's where a lot of people end up after working a hard career and doing well by their family and making some kind of exit. And it's like, yeah, but now what? And and some suddenly right at the time when the markets are up here, and only to find you know like in the next few months. The markets take a drop and like they're like oh well, what do i do now do i go back to work or do we just let our have, have to diminish our lifestyle like we never thought we'd have to before that's right that's not really a great place to be after you work three four decades to try to build something up and have a future it's not really the goal i think most people have no absolutely well you know the, one of the the great arguments for real estate is other than those wacky japanese no one's making any more of it you know <laughs> I mean, I, I used to, I used to, I used to laugh and, um, in my younger days, I, and I would say no one's making more real estate, but then, you know, Dubai and Japan started making islands. So right. I can't really say that anymore. Right. Right. Talk a little bit about that and, and the, the built-in scarcity that that creates and why that makes real estate a more stable investment over time. Well, I think the, the, the real stability greater stability in real estate is that because it's a tangible asset and it is more illiquid. So the, that marketplace can't change on emotions. Uh, it certainly will trend with the greater economy, no question about it, but there's, there's more time. And what I like about real estate is there's, you know, different, different, um, different verticals. Uh, we, we call it, you know, finance, we call it the capital stack, right? The capital stack. I mean, every, every kind of financing is based on what we call a capital stack. And just to make that simple for our listeners is, you know, at the top of the stack, you have basically equity, which is ownership. It's, it's, it's owning your practice. It's owning your home. It's owning your commercial dental building. Uh, you own it. You may owe something to a bank, but you own it. You have the equity, you get to drive it, you get to manage it, you get whatever mm-hmm. income comes off of it. You, you also take the losses when you have uh, some kind of capital expenditure or something ha- happens, you take both sides of that coin, right? Uh, the bank, on on the other hand, who, who funds uh, that kind of acquisition, whether it's your home or your, or your dental practice or your dental building, the bank is on the debt side of the capital st- stack. It's it, The debt is an asset to the bank. It's a liability to us if we're the borrower and owner of the equity. So we got equity at the top, we got debt at the bottom. Most people think about real estate and certainly business as wanting to own the equity. Well, that's, that's where all the all the growth is that's where the or the where where the, where the income generates where, where we add the value to it right we can do something with that and that's what we like to do and that's typically where people want to be whether you buy a rental house or you do short-term rentals or you're in a multi-family syndication or you're your dental practice and and building out to a dso sale i mean that's your equity play right okay 
the debt side being the bank sounds pretty freaking boring. All right. Uh, but the bank gets paid first. Well, I, but, I, I now, let, let me, let me interject here because, huh? because you're on a run and I don't want to really interrupt, but I, I feel like I feel the need to, how many people out there do you think don't truly understand that with a fiat currency, debt is wealth creation? Well, very few, very few guys look up fractional reserve and watch a video called money is debt. It's eye opening. It's a whole history of the world whenever it comes to banking. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great historical uh, aspect to look at because it gives you the understanding of what's happening there. Uh, my kind of my point in looking at the, the capital stack in this regard is we can, uh, as investors, we can choose where we want to be in the capital stack. Now, in the financial market, it's stocks or bonds. Okay, just go back and make it simple. Stocks or bonds. And typically, you know, bonds are kind of like your safety net. Uh, it's where you go to to be more conservative. It's when you where you, you move from stocks, equities to bonds, you know, after you do a sale of a business and you want to be protective. Well, that hasn't worked out so well in an inflationary environment, uh, you know, where interest rates you know, over the last 15 years until recently have been next to zero. Like that hasn't worked out real well. So it forces most people who would want to be more conservative, be savers to play in the markets, right? Because they kind of mm -hmm. have to. I mean, you have to get a yield, got to get a return. Well, now we've, we've got the shift in the markets happening now where where real interest rates uh, have finally gone up for the first time, you know, in 15 years. Uh, and now we're in a place where the you know risk free rate, we call it risk free because we think, you know, the government backs it and the government, you know, has a, a gun that will, you know, force taxpayer money out to pay the pay the, the debt on the treasuries. But you can get, you know, treasuries today at five, five and a quarter, five and a half. And and some people say, well, that's pretty darn good. Not your point. Inflation will eat, eat that up. So you can't you can't sit in fixed income forever. Uh, wish we could, but you can't. So my point is, is when we go through a market shift, if you're really focused on navigating your capital base, your investment capital, not your business in this case, but your investment capital, you can start to choose and you can, you, and we're always moving our money, not, not, not in a mouse click, you know, it's not like that, but looking at the trends and as we've seen the interest rates go up over the last 18 months, we see what's happening to the margins on equity. Uh, the risk is higher in equity today. Well, we, in general, been moving more to the, the debt side of the capital stack and being the bank where we can still get very nice yields but we're not going to stay there forever because you're right. right. Eventually, inflation will eat that up. But if I want some higher ground and get better yields than treasuries, which treasury is not a bad place to be if you've got plenty of money, you can sit there for a while and then wait for the opportunities. Because you said it earlier, I think after after the first of the year, sometime in 2024, we're going to start to see some major hits in in in, in all the markets. I, I, could, I could be Take smoking crack here, but I believe that the um, that the Christmas numbers, whenever they come in. Mm -hmm. Um, I think probably probably Black Friday numbers were decent. I haven't looked at them, but I would I would I would think that they would be starting to decline at this point. But I could be wrong. Well, but but, I, I, I believe that Christmas numbers are going to be very very tight I when do people come back with the returns. Yeah, Black Black Friday numbers um, and the bulk of it was online, as you would expect. Uh, mm -hmm. We're actually we're actually a little bit higher than they expected. But I think what they're, what they're doing is they're pulling everything forward. Uh, you know, to Black Friday, and and people are still living a lot on the assumption oh, that there's going to be more free money, and and you know the the debt the debt's piling up, you know, uh, in the trillions of dollars, the, the amount of credit card debts piling up. So mm -hmm. I think people are still living on the the fumes of what we had from the stimulus from the COVID, and I think I think that whole rock's getting ready to turn. I think you're right. I think I think the whole thing's going to spin out of control because the the rubber meets the road here. Uh, when people just are out of money, uh, and they can't you know stack any more up on their credit cards. We're done. We're done. And Absolutely. I'm, that's, we, we have to have things go into a correction mode. And it's, 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 there's and, a whole and lot of And the correction mode is good for us. It, it, it's if, truly good for us because it's going to find the true foundation of the economy. Yeah. It will probably it, be higher, but yeah. you know. I, I know I agree with it's, it's, it's like, it's going to be painful. It's going to be painful. It's, it's like, it's like, what do we have forest fires? I mean, do we want forest fires or what right. do we have floods? It, well, you got to wash out the excesses, right? That's what they do. And, right. and, and t people have losses and, yeah, lives are lost. I mean, I, I'm not for any of that. But but in terms of the economy, yes, you need you need to flush it out. But here's here's the problem. I don't mean to go down a rabbit hole with this at all. No, so please. You don't have to, you you, don't have to are touch. Are you kidding me? I love rabbit holes. <laughs> but 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 Doc, here's here's the thing: is we've got a country in general, and it, that has been built particularly 
our younger generations, and I'm not throwing barbs at them at all because I've got I, I've got kids, you've got kids, but in general, they've been built on, um, you know, I'm here, I deserve, you know, and the problem is when 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 it's taken away, and and right now, you you, you know, I don't go on to it, but I see clips of people, kids on kids, millennials typically on TikTok talking about, you know, they you know they they can't they can't live like you know they grew up with their parents. And they're complaining, and 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 it's, and it's real. I mean, it's real. I mean, I mean, the cost of rents or a first first time home buyer uh, with an auto basic auto loan today. I right. mean, you start looking at the cost of that. I mean, you're talking about Tuition. needing. You're talking about needing. Yeah, you're talking about probably needing between a husband, a wife, and, and a, maybe one child at least a hundred grand to make that even come close to, right. to to funding that. And so many are not even close to that, and they got the student loans on top of that. So they are in a tough place now. I mean, what I'm saying is we go through this correction and it gets dicier. What happens to the social mood? Right. I mean, that's not, I mean, I'm again, that's what I'm saying. I just think, and so, so what does the government do there? Do they come back in and do they just come and stoke the flames of inflation one more big time, just try to appease everybody? Where, and where are we? Where are we then? Now, now, I mean, inflation hurts, hurts them, hurts them badly, but also if they can't get, get their, their good food. I mean, what, what do you do? You, you shoplift your food. I mean, I mean, what, what happens? I don't know. I just thought a lot of stuff out there that I think about, I don't have any, I don't have the answers for it. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you three studies that I've read. One of them actually has been a while. Um, it was actually in 2019, but it is what told me that we were about to hit a bus cycle. I think COVID interrupted it and elongated yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, the other two were relatively recent. Uh, the first is in September of 2019, the Federal Reserve put out a white paper discussing the Swiss move to the negative interest rate mm -hmm. as a way to force people to take savings out and yeah. to bleed the older generation, the savers, so that they could initiate the economy. And the Federal Reserve was considering that uh, because, you know, there was, there was no quantitative easing that could take place because the, the interest rates were so low. Um, the, the next thing, the next study that I read said that the average age that children leave their parents' homes now is 26 years old. No. And finally, I read a paper this past week that was discussing the fact that there is a trend of a three-generation repeat um, where that pendulum spank, swings. And if you think about it, greatest generation, mm -hmm. silent generation, baby boomers, starts again with generation X, Gen Z, Gen Alpha. Right. Kind of mind blowing because I had never seen it before. And it's funny because it was my, it was my 12 year old daughter that brought it to my attention. She's, she's kind of a nerd like me. So she had I, read it and she said, dad, I wanted to talk to you about this. This says I'm going to be just like you. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so it, it's interesting though, when you look at it. So alpha is the next X or the next greatest generation. Mm -hmm. And so they, they definitely do as a cohort seem like they're much more serious and much more, um, much more driven Here. than Gen Z was. And then the millennials were, um, talk to me a little bit about those three topics. I, I know you have ideas on them and I, I haven't gotten to talk to you about just wacky stuff like this for a while. So talk to me about that. And what, what do you see that doing to the future of the economy? And then if you if you find that you just need something more to talk about, hit us with a little bit of crypto thoughts. Oh, it is. Yeah, we, we, we go all, all kinds of events here today. Well, yeah, central banks, um, you know, interest rates. And you're right, um, going negative to, to try to get people to uh, put their money out into the economy. Right. Uh, and, and not save it. So. So, yeah, there were um, um, Aust Aust Austrian hundred year bonds were sold. You, you know that a few years ago mm -hmm. uh, with with like like next to zero in interest rates. And then they sold billions of dollars of that stuff in just a few years ago before interest rates started going up. I mean, this, this is kind of the mindset. It's like people are looking for like, well, where's the safe place to go? But now, now that we have the reality of, of central bra banks, uh, you know, with the stimulus that they put out uh, over the last number of years and now interest rates uh, having to go up because, you know, what controls interest rates really, and people think it's, well, the Fed, everybody's watching the Fed, watch the Fed, the Fed only controls the short end of the spectrum, right? They can only show, take care take care of or manipulate the short end of the, of, the, of the curve, but it's the bond market. The bond market is, is, is massively bigger than the equity market, and the bond market is where that controls the, the long end of the spectrum, which is, which is really interest rates that, that drive 
uh, everything that we talk talk about in terms of of DSO multiple sales or real estate or your home mortgage. That's what drives that. And people are talking about, well, you know, the Fed's probably done pumping, you know, the short term rates for now, and and that and that that could be, that could be. And people think, well, then they may come down a little bit, but that's the short end of the spectrum. Out here in the long end, the Fed doesn't control that. And what what happens to the bond market? The bond market has to look and say, is the Fed really in control or not? That's what the bond the people look. Look, I, I'm I'm in some ways a, a bond investor. I, I mean, I buy short term treasuries, but in real estate. Um, sometimes I, I carry for short periods of time, not long-term, uh, paper, uh, secured by real estate that could be paper that could go out 15, 20 years. Well, I have to look at that and go, well, am I willing to hold paper that is written at a coupon rate of, let's just make say 10%. Right. Well, not long-term, not long-term. If I, if I think that the fed is going to have trouble keeping inflation at, at hand, I'm going to want more. Well, that's what the bond market does when the, when the treasury tries to sell, and we'll have to sell more treasuries the long end of the, of the curve, uh, 10 year and 30 year. Back was it was a week and a half ago, they had a bust on the 30 year bond. They, they couldn't sell them. They couldn't sell them anything close to it. That's showing up now. What's going to have to happen? They're going to have to, the rates are going to have to go up. Well, that's going to affect your mortgage rate. That's going to affect everything. So I think that's how we start to have to look at the economy. Fed controls only a certain portion of the curve, but doesn't control the, the long end. So, so people put everything on the Fed. The Fed can fix this. The Fed can fix that every time the economy takes a drop, the Fed comes to the rescue, and they have in the last 15, 20 years. But I think they're out of gas. So I think we're going to get that correction for that reason. The Fed can't control it anymore. They're between a rock and a hard place. So I think that's where that goes. Um, in ter- as far as the economy, I think it's going to be I think it's gonna be volatile. I think we're going to have volatility, a lot more volatility. We're not going to have these runs where things you run, because I don't think the Fed can do that anymore. It's gonna, it, we're going to see spurts of inflation. The Fed's going to try to pat, pat, pat it down, and they'll, they'll oversteer. I think it's go boom, boom. So you're gonna have to really be, I think, on top of what you're doing with your investments. And you can't just put them and set it and forget it like a lot of people have. Right. And go, well, it's okay if I put it there. You're gonna have to really understand more about the dynamics of wherever you're investing, what the market's doing to those investments, and really be, I think, I think having access points and having a place where you can go to where you want to put your money. Again, that takes a little work. Um, all right, crypto. To me. That's kind of a, a moonshot. Um, I'm not saying I'm against it. It's more of a moonshot having a little bit of, of assets in crypto. Uh, but I think like a lot of and, and blockchain, I, I totally get. But Bitcoin uh, per se is, is is the one that people are some people are putting a lot of their hope in and in, in, and they believe it's going to go to the moon. <laughs> Maybe it does. I don't know. But I think again, there's a lot of volatility there. Uh, yeah. Where that ends up going with uh, digital currency overall and, and what's happening uh, with different central banks, ours included, and looking at doing that uh, and trying to offset that. What kind of controls are put in place? I, I think it's still still up in arms uh, right now. So having some of that, uh, I think it's an insurance policy. I think that's that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not putting a lot of st- stake in it for my long-term future for legacy, but I think having some some regard uh, of having something off the off the grid, so to speak, I think is never a bad idea. And if it's something you could, you you, you could you could look forward to lose, uh, but also have the upside, then I have I have no problem with that. That's about as deep as I'll go into crypto. I'm not not a I'm not a super student of it, other than just what I just gave you there. Oh, in a very real sense, um, I don't know if I've ever told you this 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 story. I I don't gamble. Um, when I do go gambling, uh, which is rarely. I think about it as buying drinks. So I put in my right pocket the amount that I would spend on buying drinks on a night out. As I gamble, if I win, I put the winnings in my left pocket. And my rule is I never reach in my left pocket. So I think that the stock market, in a way, and a lot of these minor Bitcoins, uh, Bitcoins, minor crypto coins, um, are the same thing. A lot of it's just gambling. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think any time that, and this is this may be where we depart because there is always opportunity and turmoil, always, always, always. I'm not smart enough to see it. I'm not knowledgeable enough to see it, and so I'm very conservative when it comes to these things. I'd I'd prefer to pull back, hold my cash, and right. buy shit when it gets cheap because people are selling at fire fire sale prices. That's how I got my second practice. Right. You know, I um, I I sold right right before COVID, like literally G, uh, February sixteenth. I signed the papers, papers on my practice. So February 16th, uh, 2020. So 
I took that money and I made a good bet mm-hmm. and I just, I, I paid off everything I own mm-hmm. and I held on to the rest of it. And then a few months in when we were still not being allowed to open my competitor next door called me up and said, are you ready to buy my practice? Yes, he's done. I, 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 yeah. I told him, yeah, he said, I'm, I'm done. I'm finished. I'm, I'm done dealing with. It. And I said, okay, I, I don't know what it's going to be worth or if it has any value at all. Right. So I don't know that I can buy it. And he said, I will make you the deal of a century. Just name a number. Well, and I said, you know, Raymond, you got to tell me what will make you whole because I'm a little afraid to spend money on a dental practice right now. I'm sure you understand. 1.54 million collections. Mm-hmm. I bought it for $415,000. Wow. Great buy. What, what, uh, curious. So what, what did you do? What did you do with it? I turned around and sold 70% to MB2 and now I just draw dividends without working. <laughs> so I am, um, but, but that was my philosophy for what I wanted to do with MB2. That's mm-hmm. the whole reason I partnered. And, and I, I see a lot of people, and this is, this is the, one of the topics that we haven't really hit so far. Um, I see a lot of people talking about, Oh, you know, you're really, it's a bad financial decision, this, that, and the other. If you do it correctly, it's a really good financial decision and it gives you, you know, mailbox money and who doesn't want mailbox money. Mm-hmm. It's just, you have to have a you know situation where I had the perfect storm, you know, right. I bought a practice that was severely undervalued. You know, that practice probably should have cost me between 900 and mm-hmm. 901 point. Well, nine, 901 1, I think probably oh, uh, depending upon what the EBITDA was, but you know, I, I, I made out like a bandit on that because my philosophy was when I saw that white paper, I sold everything I had in the stock market. I pulled the hell out. My buddy, Mike, Mike Tran makes fun of me all the time. He's like, man, you missed the hump. It's like, yeah. I, I, I missed the drop too. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, well, but, but, yeah, but you, you, you also had an alternative. Uh, you had something you knew do it and, and you know, you, you make your money on the buy side. And that's what you're able to do with your friend's practice. I mean, he, he was ready to, he, he was done. I mean, COVID did that to a lot of people. A lot of businesses said, you know, I'm done. We're out of here. And, you know, if you're in a position where you know what to do with that asset, uh, you can turn it. And I think, again, that's that's because you're on the forefront of understanding uh, things about business uh, and being out there and having a network. And then also a collaboration, in this case, with a DSO MB2 that you already had relationships with. You right. just tie the things together. And that's something yeah. that takes being out there a little bit uh, and, 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 and communicating and seeing what's there uh, and not just taking a you know, a, 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 just a, a stay in this one lane and do everything the way the industry said, it's like, you have to be open to look at what the opportunities and you're right in turmoil comes a lot of opportunities and how many people are really thinking about that and positioning themselves for it, or they just kind of, they, hit need, the they stand need to up. be, I'm just, I'm just going to keep working and just keep working. It's like, no, put, pull your head out of the stand and look around a little bit. There, there's, there's some different loads that you can take advantage of, of if you're positioned, right. There's gonna be a lot of turmoil. There's gonna be a lot of, a lot of gnashing, gnashing of teeth, you know, a lot of, a lot of occlusal guards will be having to print it the next few years because because I think there's going to be a lot of that. Did um, you did you see the numbers on those after COVID? Uh, oh, I I, I read or, a report. What were they? Oh, oh, like double well, normal charts off the charts. Yeah, off the charts. It, it was people were saying, oh, it's COVID that's causing uh, some sort of a, a physiological response that causes. No, people are fucking stressed out. That's Just fucking their teeth. Their teeth. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly, uh, but. Yeah, just back, 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 back to back to our point is is I, I think I think people have just got to create enough margin to to be able to get out of you know of the the space they're in and the dental space is a very 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 tight space you're wearing loops all the time right. and, and that's what you have to do but you just you've got to be able to put yourself back in and find a network somewhere that can allow you to 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 look at things a little bit differently I think that's the main thing uh, you know that I I learned early on is just find networks of people not necessarily in your same uh, arena of training. Um, right. I was saying, saying this case outside of, of dentistry, but you know, investments or other things that have interest to you, that's where you're going to find out you know, what's happening. And uh, it, does it take a little time, a little bit of effort? Yeah, but is it worth it? Heck yeah. I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't do it any other way today. So I, I, I've got to have, my curiosity is, is too great. And, and again, you, you can spend yourself too thin. So you have to look for some guardrails and you can't take your eye off the ball. You know, your, your dental practice is what, it's got to you where you are. So you don't want to take your eye off the ball and you don't want to mismanage that. But still, you've got to look for what, you know, as you said earlier, how do I continue to evolve? How do I continue right. to evolve whatever it is I want to do? And that could be little steps or sometimes you can take a big, a big jump if you're in the right place at the right time and have the mindset to do it. And I'll, I'll tell you this, 
and this is something I'll, I'll definitely bring your way. Um, myself and a partner are um, creating a fund that um, it's, I don't want to put too much out there uh, at this point. It's a syndicated fund um, that is going to allow us to do t- two types of investor. Um, we're aiming mostly at dentists because they're going to be mostly dental companies. Um, might have some veterinary, some chiropractor in there as well. Um, fintech, um, tech companies, things that have a great multiple. Um, and we're going to be bringing it in to our groups and to dentists. I'd love to have you work with us once you get a, take, get a chance to take a look at it because I, I know that it's right up your alley. But one of the things that we're going to do and I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Uh, it's going to be called Dream Makers Industries Funds because DMI is one of my companies. Sure. But um, we are working with Revere um, in, in a special capacity. They're going to be vetting some things for us to make sure that we've got proper financial oversight and everything. But one of the things that we're going to do is I've decided to capitalize on two things. One is Uberization and the other is the Kickstarter effect. So in addition to dentists bringing, and I hate using this term because it's so bandied around, but smart money into the equation, we're going to also have a Kickstarter portion of this, Kickstarter-ish portion of this, where assistants and hygienists and spouses or whoever can also invest small amounts um, where at a certain threshold, it's an equity investment, but underneath that, they receive perks, discounts, um, tchotchkes, um, you know, swag, gamification. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? Could be very interesting. Um, yeah, I think we can bring something that that can be open to uh, different levels of investors. Uh, they can kind of you know play where they want to, right? Um, mm-hmm. The affinity to something that's gamified uh, that can bring a lot to it. Uh, yeah, I was always interested to take a look at something. So when you have it uh, more solidified, uh, let me know and be happy to take a look. Absolutely. I'll probably give you a call in the next couple of weeks. So guys, I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, Dave, thank you again for coming on to the show and kind of sharing some of your, your wisdom with us and some of your knowledge. Um, where can they learn more about what you do? and how you may be able to help them. Freedomfounders.com is the website, but I think probably like you, the, the, the podcast I have, uh, Dentist Freedom Blueprint Podcast, uh, where I every week I put out an episode that has something to do with economy or investments, sometimes very specific into real estate, sometimes not. Um, I've got some books on Amazon, as you mentioned, and uh, I do have a YouTube channel, uh, Dr. Phelps' uh, YouTube channel, which again, I'm just spin out different thoughts during the week about different things. Sometimes they're rants like you do. Uh, sometimes <laughs> it just depends on what's on my mind. So there's different ways to connect. Uh, but I, I really appreciate uh, the conversation today. It's always fun. Uh, I love the fact that we can go in about uh, 15 different directions and, uh, and, and bring them back around. Uh, we all circle. tie them back up in the end, don't we? <laughs> I, exactly. Exactly. It's all good. Fantastic. So I hope that you found something in our conversation that you can bring home yourself that is going to leave you in a better position. Until the next time, thank you for joining the Dear Doc podcast. Thank you for being a listener. Thank you for being a member of the business of dentistry. And David Phelps, thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thanks, Doc. Well, guys, until next week.